welcome back to those who are watching. It's actually been like a week since the mm -hmm. part A. <laughs> yeah. um, we did a part B, and then I, that footage did not successfully record, but I can verify that this is recording uh, just by looking over and watching the recording going, so everything's good. Um, so where we left things... Uh, it, interestingly enough, where things ended up, uh, I'll just cut to the chase for those who are watching, um, is that I thought it was possible that Mead is an ISFJ, and he proposed that he's actually an INFP, and uh, we spent some time talking about those two types as possibilities, um, and uh, I have an idea for what we can do for this video, uh, but I wanted to ask are there any other types that you had considered any with any level of seriously uh, seriousness um, for myself uh, that those well especially INFP resonates for me the most but mm -hmm. uh, other people uh, who I've engaged with online say there's no way that I'm an introvert that I, I they they feel that I'm an ESFP uh, oh, okay. So, or an ENFJ, or something like that. Something very different than uh, sure, sure, sure. Than I, res that that makes sense. Uh, and I guess it's because I do have a habit of I do say things like I don't have a filter always. Sure. So sometimes I'm like that. <laughs> well, but, uh, uh, INFPs do have do do have introverted feeling at the top, which is a judging function, and then mm -hmm. extroverted intuition. So I mean. It's not outrageous that an INFP can can be seen as extroverted uh, to some degree. As far mm -hmm. as ESFP, um, ESFPs lead with a perceiving function, uh, so it yeah. they can sometimes come across as introverts. Um, it depends on the ESFP. Uh, what was the other type again? ENFJ. Oh, ENFJ. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can probably disqualify that one from the previous video just because of your preference for extroverted intuition over introverted yeah. intuition. So, right. And ESFPs use introverted intuition as well. So we can mm -hmm. probably say that you're probably not an ESFP. Right. Um, so I think it, I think ISFJ is a more likely alternative than INFP to, to INFP than ESFP or uh, ENFJ would be. Right. Based on, uh -huh. Your your f frequent use of introverted sensing and of extroverted intuition. So I think it's fair to say that you probably prefer introverted sen sensing, extroverted intuition. And where we can really kind of dig in a little bit tonight is introverted thinking versus extroverted thinking, mm -hmm. uh, because ISFJs will prefer introverted thinking and INT INFPs will prefer extroverted thinking. Um, and then also, like. Extroverted feeling versus introverted feeling is, in my opinion, a little harder to test for mm -hmm. um, because they can look similar um, just for different motivation reasons. Like you can be motivated to behave a certain way towards a, towards somebody and you and that, that way could either be kind or manipulative or, or whatever and that might be motivated either by your sense of wanting to... Um, you know, I mean, I, an introverted feeler, mm -hmm. it depends on where it is in the stack, I guess. So, you know, anyways, all right. So my, my thought on, well, go ahead. You look at you guys. Oh, to say. I was just, I was going to mention that, does that shadow also the TI, like the TI users, uh, is, in terms of introverted thinking and extroverted thinking, does that parallel to the, the uh, feeling part? Or is that something yes, separate? Yes, it does. Okay. It's an axis. So the TIFE axis and the uh, TEFI axis. So mm -hmm. okay. So if we can figure out if you're an extroverted thinker or an introverted thinker, mm -hmm. we should be able to figure out if you're an introverted feeler or an extroverted feeler. Okay. Um, by there, there does by seem to be a little. When I'm reading about both types, the INFP and ISFJ, mm -hmm. there there do seem to be some uh, unique similarities. Uh, in some ways, uh, yeah, I, they share half the function. Thing. They share half a functional preference, so you you would see, yeah. yeah, you would see some similarities. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and by the way, INFJs and ISFJs also share a lot of similarities too. Mm -hmm. um, mainly that middle two, the F E T I, middle two functions. Uh -huh. So, um, like my best friends an ISFJ, and we we have a lot in common as far as, far as how we process information. Um, so, all right, I, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna tell you what my proposal for tonight is. Okay. I am going to give you a lengthy TI argument. Mm -hmm. It has many parts. Okay. And if you are a third slot TI TI user, you should be able to deconstruct my argument or at least I don't know. I well, you may or may not be able to deconstruct it, but what what my point is, I want to see how you rebut provide a rebuttal to this argument okay because i know you probably will have a rebuttal for it mm -hmm. and i want to hear how you construct that rebuttal okay and then i'm going to try to make sense out of the the rebuttal and see how that fits with ti versus te because i think a ti user will um will construct arguments a certain way versus a te user mm -hmm. so um you know, because an ISFJ is going to be using NE and, -E and TI, kind of like an ENTP, but less preference for that. Mm -hmm. So they will be able to play devil's advocate in a way. Um, whereas an INFP will be less, less, less um, adept at that, I guess. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, read a... Um, Read a, a. So I mean, this is, as a TI user myself, this is my way of thinking about this. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? This is how, okay. So before I tell you what the argument is, um, what I'm going to do is since since we talked about religion in the last uh, in the last um, call, and that's something you and I have in common because I've spent 30 years of my life studying it, and uh, my dad's a pastor. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with the Bible. I'm very familiar with doctrine. I've read a lot about it and studied it myself and argued about it from both sides, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. So I've argued it from your side and mm -hmm. I've argued it from this side. So um, quite extensively on both sides, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I might be able to um, pose a question to you that is sufficiently complicated <laughs> to stretch you a little bit in okay. how you answer this. And then, uh, and it's my own argument. So I mean, it's a total TI thing. Like you, this is, there's not this is not an argument you probably find on the internet. It's just something I formulated in my own. Okay. Head. Um, so, all right. Um, before I read the argument to you, I need to know first of all, do you uh, do you hold to a literalist or a figurative? understanding of or reading of the Bible um, I'm a fundamentalist but not Great. a literalist not a literal not a literalist no and why not, why would you I not be a literalist okay well fundamentalism is uh, I believe in the fundamental principles of the Bible but I do believe there are like Jesus himself used used uh, uh, the uh, analogies allegories sure and and sort of uh, there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible it it does have a lot of under you know underneath yeah. things so but but now do you think that when Jesus used symbols it mm -hmm. was clear to the listener that they were symbols uh, that is very hard to answer I guess it depends on who was who the individual was are you talking about the disciples or the uh, or who? Or well, general? do you feel like Jesus was an effective enough communicator to make it clear to people that what he was saying to them was figurative? Um, I do. Okay, I do too. Yeah. Because uh, if you look at uh, his, I remember him saying, uh, t telling an allegory to the Pharisees, and then them getting really pissed off at him because once they once they heard it, they realized mm -hmm. what he was saying. And mm -hmm. they didn't need the literal un right. understanding. So I think yeah. that's an important that's an important thing to probably keep in mind when we okay. think about these things. Is that 
if Jesus was an effective communicator, which is the, which is a fair premise, I think, mm -hmm. and he's God, right? Then he should he should have been able to successfully make it clear or obvious when something is metaphorical or when it's not. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a fair premise to you? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think um, to me you have so now we're so you may you, you may or may not um, agree with all these premises but this okay. is what but this is why I wanted to ask you that question I want to I want to read this to you and then uh, and then I want to get your reaction and, and I, I'll share the I'll share the list in the chat as well so right. premise one Christian doctrine is based on Christ and the death burial and resurrection of Christ um, premise two the understanding of the fall is based on a literal interpretation of Genesis and Adam and Eve's sin. With no literal sin, there is no literal salvation. Th premise three, the, gen the genealogies in the Bible go from Adam to Christ via both Joseph and Mary. We find both of those genealogies in the Bible. Premise four, James Usher proposed in 1650 that the earth is around 6,000 years old based on these chronologies. Premise five, Andromeda is our closest galactic neighbor at 2.5 million light years away. Premise six, the light from Andromeda and beyond would not have reached us on Earth in 6,000 years. Premise seven, either all scientists are wrong about the distance away of Andromeda or the speed of light, or the Bible is wrong about the creation story. Premise eight, since we can measure the speed of light and see Andromeda, but we can't go back in time 6,000 years. The most plausible explanation is that the Bible is not factually correct. Premise 9, if the Bible, or should I, it's not a premise really, we're getting to conclusions, I guess. Um, number 9, if the Bible is not factually correct, neither is Christianity. And then the final point that I would make is just that the counter argument has been raised that the Bible never says how old the earth is and that there could be millions of years between creation and the flood but that is not supported by the plain reading of the text, which is how we are supposed to interpret the story of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that that would be the argument, and I'll I'll copy and paste this uh, into the chat, and then uh, I will just listen now, and and then I'd like to hear how you would rebut that, mm -hmm. and then based on that, I'm listening less to what you're, I am, t two sides of things, I think this will be interesting, one, I want to hear what you have to say, but two, I want to deconstruct how you say it, and I want to think about what that means about your personality. Okay. So the floor uh, is yours. Okay, do you want me to, I could I could rebut each point, or I could give you a first a summary of, of my, my theology to, to explain how I come to that conclusion. Of the Bible being factual, I want you to do whatever's comfortable for you. Okay. Uh, first of all, at the okay, this is how I understand it. When when I read the Bible, um, it's like a code. So God is beyond human comprehension. So there was a time and space when, for whatever reason, He decided to reveal Himself to the Jewish people. I don't know why. But, but he's God, so his ways are not quite our ways, and so the Bible is is a historical text, so it captures the the culture of that time, but also it was wrapped in divinity. It's like they the inspired word of God was manifested through the authors of the Gospels, and so. Uh, to address the timeline, because that's very controversial, I do think that there's scientific evidence that the Earth is much younger than we have been led to believe. Is it 10,000 or 6,000 years old? I really do not know. But uh, what one thing I do have an issue with is I do not believe in evolution. So I am a creationist. <laughs> um, and I used to believe in evolution, but I came to the conclusion that actually evolution, how could an intelligent person believe in evolution? There were so many things that did not make sense to me, and I can't illustrate every single facet of that. I just know that in my heart that evolution was not, it, it didn't, didn't make sense. Okay. And 
Okay, so I'm getting to a to a point. Yeah, uh, yeah, go uh, for it. Okay, so in 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 the broad spectrum of things, um, there is archaeological evidence to back up much of what we know in the Bible. So yes, I believe that the the uh, the way the Bible is written is on a level that we can comprehend, and it is. It has certain contradictions, but actually that makes it, to me, that makes it more credible. Because, I, I don't know how to explain this, uh, the contradictions make it less likely that it was contrived. It, it seems to fit, if, if you put like pieces of a puzzle, you say, okay, I can see how that works. So. To address the what your the the broad thing of the the, the solar system and what scientists say, um, I do believe that uh, there it does not conflict with the it doesn't conflict with scientific theory. Um, in fact, science supports it. So um, so basically, I, I believe in in the biblical principles. It explains why we're here, where we're going, and how to get to God, how to get back to God. Okay. Do you feel like it has to do with the authority of the Bible, the, the, the way that it, the Bible is written in such an authoritative way? Um, uh, okay, what do you mean by authoritative? Do you mean like the, the laws, like the... the uh, well... The associated with with uh, sin, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, and that's part of it. Uh, but uh, uh -huh. it's sort of like um, uh, it's sort of like um, it's sort of like if you can observe a law in action in your life, mm -hmm. and that law is codified in the Bible that must mean that the Bible is true because it is it was correct about the law of sowing and reaping and therefore it must be correct about Jesus death burial burial and resurrection or something like that mm -hmm. is that is that something that you I don't look at it quite that way how do you look uh, how do you look at it as far as okay. the trustworthiness of the Bible what what it what exactly are you looking at it's uh, when when okay. you make that conclusion, um, it really has to do with. Uh, first of all, it's sort of like you have to connect to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, it's like a light switch comes on, and sure. when you everything makes sense. Okay. So if you try to explain it to a non-believer, yeah. if you, if they look at the Bible, it's like this. This doesn't make any sense. Right, right, right. So that's so, how I see it. So would it be fair to say that it's an irrational thing? Um. Well, uh, no, I don't believe it's irrational. But what, uh, it, what what we're talking about, though, is experiential, not rational. Because, like, a rational mm -hmm. thing is something you come to through a rational conclusion. And by that, I mm -hmm. mean A plus B equals C. It's uh -huh. very non-emotional. It's okay. just, strictly speaking, it is, a, it is an argument built on premises. But what you're describing is more of a personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not rational. It'd be like okay. it'd be like, for example, if uh, if lightning struck the ground next to me and I lived, mm -hmm. perhaps I might have a strong experiential change in my life mm -hmm. <laughs> due oh, to that. Yeah. Uh, in oh, fact, that it, very yeah. thing happened to um, Martin Luther. And, and, yeah. and was was actually foundational in his conversion. Mm -hmm. So um, so when I say irrational, I don't necessarily mean wrong. Mm -hmm. But what I do mean is not f built on a foundation of rationality. Yeah, it's built on a foundation of personal experience mm -hmm. or. You know that the Christian Christians would would bristle at me saying emotion, but but when I what I would say why I would say emotion is is because you you have like hard reason you know which is which is 
calculated and dis dis uh, affected by emotions. Uh huh. It's sort of like reason in the face of my emotions. It's sort of like my emotions want me to go this way, but my reason right. says to go this way, right? Well, and, yeah, and, yeah. And then, mm -hmm. whereas, uh, whereas something that's irrational, mm -hmm. the the rational side says go this way, but the but the emotions say or the, or whatever's left. It could be emotion and intuition or whatever. But it's it's sort of like the part of you that's not thinking mm -hmm. a b a plus b equals c it's the part of you that is you know it's in your gut kind of right yeah i go with gut feeling often but i i think someone could come to the same conclusion with what you're describing uh i mean even if you read about doubting thomas and sure so the people in the characters in the bible they all had different, you know, MBA TI, TI types. Sure. And so they all came to the same conclusion, but through a different thing. So um, it doesn't mean it's not true. So that's where, see, I believe there's absolute truth. And when people say, well, my truth is my truth, I think what they're saying is it's their perspective or their opinion, mm -hmm. but it's not a different truth. It's the same. Like when, uh, if there's a crime and you have several witnesses to a crime, each person will give a different testimony about that. Right. But it still right. makes it doesn't make it a lie. <laughs> right. So, well, so, so what usually happens in a crime scene is you have each person presenting their irrational point of view, mm -hmm. and then you have a detective who's a very rational person who has no emotional attachment to the situation, who takes down the data and then compares it to other data and other facts and draws some kind of rational conclusion not necessarily based on their, his, his emotions um, it was interesting that you brought up Doubting Thomas because that is a good example of a uh, rational point of view on this unfortunately mm -hmm. we don't have Doubting Thomas here to talk to to get a first hand right. witness account uh, mm -hmm. to validate that what was written was accurate but uh, certainly makes for a really good story. Um, so um, I think but, it, I think okay. I think you're more likely to be an INFP, to be honest, than than an okay. ISFJ, based on how, your argumentative style. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, you you certainly um, you certainly use argumentation that is not that does not. Uh, is not built upon more more like concrete premises, but okay. but more based mm -hmm. and and like logical conclusions, um, but based more on um, a com I think a combination of um, your feelings and then also you know your experiences right and then mm -hmm. um, you know of course you're building you're building arguments in your in your head too but it's sort of like where do those what are the foundations yeah. of those arguments, kind of? So it's not that you're not doing any argumentation, not using mm -hmm. any TI, obviously. Everybody uses TI to some degree. But it's more like, to what degree do you, to what degree are you relying on mm -hmm. it to, to make these more foundational decisions? You right. Know? So, well, yeah. That's, how, think, that's what yeah. I would, that's my, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think I, of that. I, I, I see, yeah, I, it does kind of make sense to me. I do think, though, that, uh, Okay, I'm not the best um, <laughs> orator. Uh, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, theologian, you know. But yeah. I do think that someone could make very logical. Okay, they could win someone over. Like the Bible does, it has it has a logical thing to it, element to it. But I don't know how to to extrapolate on that. Or I don't know how to 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 deliver that. Um, and I think there's some ministers that really do. I mean, there's some atheists, hardcore atheists that I think atheists are hardcore ISTJ. Or I don't know what they might be, but they seem they're they're so almost logical to extreme where it almost it, they're illogical because they're so close to a certain uh, well element. That's that's that, that's one specific position. That's specifically yeah. hard atheism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you could think about it, um, there's a guy that you should look up. Um, his name is uh, do, 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 David Eagleman. I'll mm -hmm. type his name here, David Eagleman. Um, and he 
he talks about possibilianism, which is a term he coined. <laughs> okay. Uh, and what possibilianism is, it says this. It says, there's fundamental Christianity right there. Pink. There's Islam. There's mm -hmm. atheism. There's agnosticism. There's Judaism. There's Hinduism. Many religions. There's yeah. all this, all yeah. this other space out here, though. Right. Which is every other possibility. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's that's I I think I live more in that realm, which is okay. Um, that um, I've seen enough disqualifying evidence mm -hmm. for those other viewpoints. I actually haven't seen enough. I haven't seen enough disqualifying evidence to say that there is no God. Mm -hmm. But I've certainly seen enough disqualifying, in my opinion, disqualifying evidence mm -hmm. that any of the gods that people propose is the god that exists is actually the god that exists. Um, right. So, yeah. so you wouldn't hear yeah. me saying there is no god, but okay. uh, uh, because that would that would go against the Book of Psalms, which says the fool has said in his heart there is no god. Right, and I'm no fool, uh -huh. but uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but the point being. I also uh, have studied the Bible thoroughly enough mm -hmm. uh, to have. Uh, it's sort of interesting. Like you can you can study the Bible you can study the Bible a lot and become a more f solid Christian, and then you keep uh -huh. then you can keep studying the Bible mm -hmm. and you keep studying the Bible, and eventually, if you keep studying the Bible enough, it can deconvert you. <laughs> well, that's interesting because. I took a world religions class, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of you know Christians, take that class and they end up not believer at all. And and I actually it strengthened my faith. Sure. After t after studying other religions, then I actually drew from those things and I make comparisons and I so well this this actually makes more sense. But also uh, the the basis, the big thing, Christianity is the resurrection. Without the resurrection, we have no hope. So that was that's a big thing, um, and so had he not fulfilled the it was the miracles were one thing, and and he was this great you know speaker, and he was doing so many things that were so different at that time, but had he not resurrected, then as Paul said, our faith would be in vain. Sure. Pretty much. <laughs> well, so, let's let's uh, examine the possibility, the possible arguments against the resurrection, because mm -hmm. that. So when I when I grew up, there were lots of little catchy sayings that people would say, like, either Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Yeah. Have you heard, have you heard that one? No. <laughs> That's the only three possibilities. It's not possible that uh, that the text was incorrectly passed okay. down, or yeah. that you know what I mean. So uh, that in that in that in that worldview, um, or that. Uh, you know, fan fiction made its way into the story. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what, what's really interesting, I think, about the story of Jesus is how similar it is. And people, people do point this out, people who are mm. antagonistic against Christianity, do mm. point out how similar it is to, to the other uh, kind of Christ myths that that came out. There was a, probably about a dozen people around Christ's time that were sort of like him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's mythological, as we think of them, myth mythological um, traditions that have a lot of similar um, things to them, such as virgin birth and yeah, uh, and, and, but, a, and, um, a, and a deity, yeah, a deity born mm -hmm. to a virgin, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know. The Christian viewpoint of that is well, um, that has to do with, you know, there's no, there's not a really good explanation I've heard for why that those happened before Jesus was born, but they sort of would kind of like say, well, it's inconsequential, sort of just this is a just a thing that has happened, and mm -hmm. you know, people will create stuff uh, all the time, um, and uh, you know, and then others will say, well, it came after, so it was. A copycat of what happened. Well, um, okay, go ahead. Well, so so I just just to conclude, I guess, um, considering the world back then, and essentially, like if you think about mm. even the world today, how much oh. mis how much misinformation you get, yeah. oh, even in a world yeah. where you can yeah. even try to fact check things, right? right? You, 
it's craziness. You can't. Like, now, you go back 2,000 years and you've had so many generations of people from then till now that had political motivations, religious motivations. Some of them were very creative and um, expressive people. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of them were bored. (laughs) Some of them were genuine vandals. Um, Some of them had malicious intent. There's many different motivations why people would do and say things, right? So when it comes down to... um, it is is a fair and possible alternative that Jesus was uh, somebody, but that what has been written about him has been mm-hmm. embellished due to reasons, due to political reasons, religious mm-hmm. reasons, something right. to do. It's it's fun mm-hmm. to write things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, it's fun to write stories or or having visions. Right? People will. Have, they will have a dream or they will have a psychedelic trip and mm-hmm. they will say this was God speaking to me I need to write it down and you know and so there's there's many possible explanations that don't have to do with legitimate um, divine intervention that mm-hmm. are in my opinion more plausible because of psychosis schizophrenia um, all kinds of other mental illnesses mm-hmm that affect our perception, that affect our understanding of what's happening and what's happening around us and so on. So I think you, if you put all those things together, you have a lot of plausible explanations for the, okay. the resurrection story and other, yeah. you know what I mean? Can I, yeah, I just want to say, I'm sure you've heard this before, Sure. but what strengthens the testimony uh, in, in the resurrection story, for example? Um, okay, first of all, the testimony came from the women so women at that time, uh, their testimony was viewed uh, only a little bit above a slave. Um, I believe had the story been fabricated, it would be the men that discovered uh, the, the the tomb rolled away, and and also the uh, of course he was witnessed by hundreds of people, but uh, the people were willing to die mm-hmm. for this, sure. and I just think that. Uh, we can we can fathom, we can speculate you know maybe they had mental illness but um, I do believe that something that they witnessed to was was very strong and powerful that they said okay this is a very real thing and another thing too is uh, a lot of people are unaware of spiritual warfare which I I've studied a little bit about I do believe some mental illness not all I do believe some mental illness is demonic. And it's caused by, uh, you know, demonic in nature. So when people take psychedelic drugs, they're opening up their mind to the spiritual realm, and the demons and you know certain elements can get in there, and uh, they're opening themselves up to all kinds of negative influences. And that's why it's very. That's why I don't. Uh, <laughs> that's why I don't use recreational drugs myself. I, I feel but, like you. Uh, you. You probably need to try psychedelics more than anyone. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you may not. Uh, you may be surprised that I say say that, but yeah. Uh, what psychedelics really do at a chemical stamp? Chem- mm-hmm. Your consciousness is a chemical process. You may. Mm-hmm. You may. That may not square with your perception of the soul Um, yeah but when you go to sleep your consciousness it 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 just it's affected chemically by what's going on in your brain Um, Mm -hmm. and uh, the chemicals in your brain can affect your consciousness greatly um, Mm -hmm. and how lucidly you're you're thinking Um, and what psychedelics do is activate different parts of your brain that you're not normally using and Mm -hmm. what this ends up resulting in is experiences where you are in contact with your own subconscious in many cases or other parts of your mind that you're not normally in contact with and that's what causes you to see and hear and experience things Mm -hmm. that uh, you wouldn't normally under normal circumstances because reality is a hallucination what you're experiencing Mm -hmm. right now with me talking and you listening is Mm -hmm. a hallucination your brain has no eyes it has no ears okay it can only take in data from your peripherals which is your eyes and ears okay Mm -hmm. so everything you're experiencing right now is a hallucination you need to if you come to grips with that fact 
it suddenly changes your understanding of the nature of reality. Yeah. Okay. I, I know that, the so then, yeah. then you can realize that just taking yeah. a drug will change We create that. our own reality, but yes. I, I, I just, um, I, I have studied those different things and uh, it always, it doesn't, uh, I, I still go back to what is truth, what is truth, and um, I, I think those are all, like, I definitely, like, physiologically, they can look at things, but, okay, I'll give you an example of, uh, well, this is probably not really an example, but there was, there's people that have survived things against all odds. It, I believe miracles happen because there's things that should not happen and there's really no explanation for it. And some people say, well, that's just random experience. But there was a doc, there was a minister that had a, a brain disease that had a 2% chance of living. So his congregation gathered around him and prayed for him. And within a week, he was completely healed. He's back to normal. The doctors could not fathom how this was possible. Now people argue, why did God heal? Okay, if God is real, why did he heal that person, not that person? The answer is we just don't know because God is God and so he might have a different purpose. But let me let me for, ask you this though. Yeah. Is it more likely to you that he was in that two percent or is it more likely that there's that there's uh, that the Abrahamic God that told Abraham to kill his own son mm -hmm. and that caused a bush to be burning and talk to Moses and that uh, empowered Jesus to walk on water and that gave visions to Isaiah to see the future and that spoke to Adam in the garden. Is it more likely that that doctor, that that, that, that pastor was in the 2% or that all of those mm -hmm. other things are true? To explain what happened to him. Um, okay, well... And I uh, have to go in four minutes, so... Oh, sure, okay. You're going to have to make it quick. <laughs> All right. Um, just, okay, I'll, I'll try to sum it up that um, the, uh, miracles still happen. The, the doctor and the 2%, okay, they were saying 2%. That means that even if he survived... It's a two percent chance he would survive. He would never be normal again. Sure. The virus in in uh, his brain inflammation was was uh, it is it would destroy him. Um, I just believe that to me that's a modern day miracle. They call it miracles because they don't happen every day. So that's why it's a miracle. Sure, group. but I think so. I think there's a difference between a rarity mm -hmm. and a and a bona fide divine intervention. Okay. You know, a rarity would be a, a guy. A guy survives, uh, you know, with only two percent chance of living and and no known chances of full recovery. A mm -hmm. rarity would be that that person recovering. A bona fide miracle would be something so uh, disprovable. I, mm -hmm. I guess not. That's not the right word. It would be something so unfathomable that there could not be any possible uh, natural explanation for that's, what's That's That's where our faith comes in. So, like, every day it's a daily walk, so our faith is always tested, it's always put under a litmus test, and <laughs> that's the way I look at things. I guess that's why I channel my personal views. Oh, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Um, I consider myself a traditional person, but I think... I get a little irritated when people conflate traditional with conventional because I think they're two different things. I think you can have traditional values but be a very unconventional person. So it sure. doesn't mean I'm not looking forward, uh, you know, to the future. It's just I have different values than I think most people my age or younger do. <laughs> so sure, sure. Just want to say that. Um, yeah. But okay, we're we're at the time. We're at time now. So. Um, thank, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mead. I think it was yeah. a really stimulating discussion. I feel like we, should, we could talk about theology for another hour. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. have to put some time on the calendar to really. Oh sure, maybe get, some get sometime that. soon. Maybe yeah, I'll I'll come on your channel. How about that? Oh great, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, uh, be in touch over email, and uh, thanks everybody for watching, and have a good rest of your evening. Bye. Mm -hmm.